This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 803, recorded on September 9th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. How's the week been, Daniel? Um, you know, it was. It's a little truncated um, here. Here in New York, we had a long weekend. I guess. Um, well, most of the country had a long weekend. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> it was Labor Day, right? Monday was Labor Day, and I was celebrated Labor Day by not laboring. I let other people labor. So excellent. It's it nice to have a little. I did a lot of sailing, so that was very, very nice. good. A lot of time with the family. All right, but we got lots to cover. I keep looking um, to that point when we have less to cover. We're not there yet. Uh, so let me start with my quotation. Life is a long lesson in humility. And that, that's by James M. Barry. Um, I think Peter Pan maybe was something that he created. So, um, But it, it seemed appropriate because I think science is clearly an arena where this is very much true. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say science is a lifelong lesson in humility. Um, that's why we do science because we don't know the answer. So science is really, a, I like to say, a journey, a, journal, a journey of discovery, not a path to confirmation. Uh, if we know all the answers, we would not have to do the experiments or the trials. Um, this um, episode is going to drop on 9-11. So I just want to just sort of, um, you know, take a moment there. Um, you know, I, I grew up in New York, um, so that was really uh, sort of a difficult um, day, um, well, for, for a lot of us. So, um, all right, let's, let's get into um, a number of papers here. Um, you know, the, uh, the quotation I start with um, really um, is something that has been addressed. Uh, I've seen a number of papers recently. Um, and one of them, actually a couple of them, I think are in open forum infectious diseases. Um, and the first, overlooked shortcomings of observational studies of interventions in coronavirus disease 2019, an illustrated review for the clinician, right? And so, you know, these, these updates, um, I don't know if our listeners remember, they really started off theoretically as a clinician update. Um, so I like to keep that focus, but I think we have non-clinicians that listen, right? We have um, but let me just read the abstract here because, um, you know, over the last two years, this has been a rapid um, education, re-education for a lot of clinicians when something gets published. Um, you know, it gets thrown out there as a preprint. It gets interpreted in the media. Um, and a lot of clinicians are um, trying to decide what to do um, based, unfortunately, on a lot of observational studies that may not have been done that well. Um, so let me just read the abstract here. The rapid spread of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 infection across the globe, triggered an unprecedented increase in research activities that resulted in an astronomical publication output of observational studies. However, most studies failed to apply fully the necessary methodological techniques that systematically deal with different biases and confounding which not only limits their scientific merit, but may result in harm through misleading information. Um, and um, you know, I, I am gonna highly recommend that um, all clinicians take the time to read this. Um, I think this is really critical. Um, and it's, it's only an eight page paper. It's not terrible to read. Um, you know, our, our goal is discovering what's true as clinicians, you know, when you go see the clinician, you want them to tell you what's true, not just what they're excited about. Um, and unfortunately, as we've seen over the last two years, there's been a lot of poorly done studies that um, actually got people excited about stuff that turned out not to make a difference, right? Um, and they talk in this paper about several um, several of these issues. So one, treatment selection bias. Um, maybe we remember that vitamin D study that we all got excited about. Um, and then some savvy people in Spain realized that they were giving vitamin D to the people in the healthier, less acute wards, but not giving it to people with severe disease and more issues. And so, yeah, young, healthy people do better. <laughs> so uh, was it really the vitamin D? And that, that was not helpful, if anything, that was misleading. 
Um, then there's survivor bias, right? Um, you know, you decide you're going to enroll someone in a in a treatment, um, and they have to live long enough to get the treatment. So there's sort of this immortal period introduced. So um, it's important that we understand that. Um, and then there's these competing risks, like if our endpoint is discharged from the hospital, um, what happens afterwards? Have we excluded them, um, not followed them into uh, discharge? So there's really, I think this is really um, great. There is a role for observation observational um, studies, uh, but this paper just reinforces how important it is designing, conducting, and then really, I'm going to say the integrity of publishing helpful, reliable information. Because um, if you get something out there and it supports something because of one of these biases or poor study design, that's not helpful. It's more than not helpful. It actually can be harmful. Um, the other paper that I enjoyed this last week, uh, I got all this extra time, right? So um, I could read, Critical Review of the Scientific Evidence and Recommendations in COVID-19 Management Guidelines. Um, this is really enlightening. I, I, I get to see some of this um, as I'm involved in the care of patients at multiple health systems, um, also involved in the outpatient setting, and I talk to our providers across the tri-state area. Um, well, I tend to look to professional societies or government resources like the IDSA, the NIH, uh, American Society of Hematology, or the CDC. Um, this paper gives a good description of the landscape. Um, there are actually hundreds of different recommendations out there. Um, only about half of the ones out there really have any assessment of the supporting evidence. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of discrepancies between the different guidelines. Um, and I actually think this speaks to this vacuum created by a lack um, of well-designed randomized controlled trials. Um, it also might speak to an issue with, with who creates these guidelines, right? Um, you know, each hospital, healthcare system, physician group um, out there creating their own treatment guidelines in this void. Um, I mean, I might, like, for instance, there are guidelines for treatment at Columbia University or recommended by a professional society, but then I go to a certain hospital, oh, we don't do that here. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, th this, is, this is a challenge, and I think this is another area, um, but I shouldn't complain, right? I, I have colleagues um, in rural parts of the American West, and uh, they're probably listening and saying, Dr. Griffin, <laughs> You don't need to complain, we have it worse. Um, and I won't even go into the details. You can just use your imagination, um, but you can imagine some of the guidelines in certain areas of the world and our country. All right, let's get right into children, COVID and mental health. Um, you know, as I've been saying for quite a, quite a while, children, um, children are at lower risk, but they are not at no risk. And I think everyone is really waking up to this. Um, wearing a mask is less dramatic for a child than being hospitalized. Um, and I'm going to add a new one. Children should not have to choose between health and education. Um, so I've talked a lot about the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, which has a, a COVID tracking. Um, the CDC also has a data tracking page specifically looking at pediatric um, data. So you can look at this and it's just, it's outstanding. Right? We're over, over a quarter million children were um, infected with COVID in the last week. Hospitalizations are going up. Um, just anyone who is still sort of in this idea that for children, COVID is not a problem. Um, the head's in the sand. The information is out there. Yes, two years ago, 18 months ago, when our, I always give moms the credit, um, and I think I should in most cases, when the moms were keeping the kids safe, despite what people were saying, if a kid does not get exposed to COVID-19, if they don't get infected with COVID-19, it's not a problem. But now children, um, enormous number of children, I think we're over 6 million children have been infected with COVID in this country. So. Um, we did get some data from the uh, post of MMWR, um, two really informative publications, Trends in COVID-19 Cases, Emergency Department Visits, and Hospital Admissions Among Children and Adolescents Aged 0 to 17 Years. Um, this is United States, um, August 2020 to August 2021. And so here, the CDC analyzed COVID-19 cases, ED visits, um, with a COVID-19 diagnosis, hospital admissions, um, and overall COVID-19 ED visits and hospital admissions increased since June 2021 in children and adolescents. Um, the rate per 100,000 persons of COVID-19 admissions in August 2021 
in the quartile of states with the lowest vaccination rate was almost four times higher than the quartile with the highest vaccination coverage, right? Um, think about this. Most of these kids are not eligible. So a lot of the impact here we're seeing is adults getting vaccinated and um, the benefit that can provide. Um, we also saw a second um, publication, hospitalizations associated with COVID-19 among children and adolescents, COVID net 14 states, March 1st, 2020 to August 14, 2021. Um, here they reported that the weekly, weekly COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates among children and adolescents rose nearly five fold um, during late June to mid-August 2021. The proportions of hospitalized children and adolescents with severe disease was similar before um, and during um, this period of Delta predominance. Um, hospital, hospitalization rates were 10 times higher among the unvaccinated than among the fully adolescent, uh, fully vaccinated adolescents. Um, so that's looking at the um, vaccine eligible group. Uh, so I think just important information that we have here. It's great that this is being tracked. Um, this is important when um, parents are making decisions, when adolescents are involved in shared decision-making um, about vaccines. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, not sure why people are so sensitive whenever I talk about children and COVID. Um, I'm just sharing the information. So pre-exposure period transmission testing, never miss an opportunity to test. Um, I just did a keynote talk earlier today about, um, about testing. Um, and usually this is the area where I'm trying to reinforce um, antigen testing, um, talking about PCR t detection, um, talking about how actually antigen tests um, maybe have been compared against the wrong gold standard. Um, maybe if you compare those antigen tests against viral culture, against um, contact tracing, against transmission. Um, I think I'm gonna say that antigen tests used during that two days before, three to five days after symptom, during the period of time we see transmission, um, even at home antigen tests were in the high 90s. So um, they are not an issue with lack of sensitivity during that period. Once a person is past that period of stage, once the viral RNA is low and the viral antigen gets to a very low level, yes, the antigen test will turn negative. Um, use the right test at the right time to ask the right question. But today I'm gonna to talk about serology. Um, we had a couple interesting studies uh, looking um, at serology. It's gonna be serology positivity. Um, one is the US, the other Kenya, both published in JAMA. So the first one, estimated U.S. infection and vaccine-induced SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence based on blood donations July 2020 to May 2021. Um, so this is a repeated cross-sectional study that included 1,443,519 blood donation specimens from a catchment area um, representing 74% of the U.S. population. Um, they reported that general population increased um, this is really what sort of the money here, 83.3% had a combined infection or vaccine induced antibodies. It's actually pretty high, I have to say. Um, the authors looked at both spike and nucleocapsid antibodies, you know, nucleocapsid being associated with infection, spike being from either. Um, this is a very high number. I think there's a couple things to point out. Um, people that donate blood are not necessarily representative of everyone. Um, but there was, I'll say, a little bit of a disturbing uh, feature here. If you looked at this, um, the infection-induced seroprevalence was consistently high, highest in Hispanic, um, non-Hispanic Black individuals. Um, you know, the Caucasians are getting their immunity from vaccination. Um, other populations are getting it disproportionately from infection. Now, the second article, right? So here, most people in this first study are getting their... Um, their positivity, their immunity from vaccination. I think we're up to 75% of the U.S. population has gotten a first dose, 75% of eligible. Remember, we still have a large chunk of our population, the children that are not eligible. Um, the second article was a situation where there was limited access to vaccines. And this was prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies from a national Zero surveillance of Kenyan blood donors, January through March, 2021. Um, and in this article, the authors report uh, about seroprevalence in Kenya. Um, 
this is a surveillance study looking at blood donors aged 16 to 64, um, slightly different age demographic in Kenya. We don't have as many folks over the age of 65. Um, the national prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies was estimated at various points in time, um, basically getting to sort of the end. The crude zero prevalence had gotten to as high as 44.2. Um, and this is actually in line with what we're seeing in a lot of other areas. But remember, this is dominantly coming from exposure from infection. Um, the Kenya COVID-19 vaccine program um, only began in March of 2021, so a little bit. And they're only, they were only up to 2% of the population by July 2021. So most of that is from infection. All right, active vaccination. Um, there's, there's always news um, on this front. Um, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Vaccination is how this pandemic ends. Uh, Wednesday, September 1st, right, Moderna announced its uh, completed submission for full approval of its mRNA vaccine. Um, so we're hoping um, we're going to see that coming up um, on the horizon. Why does this matter, right? Um, it, it actually seems like it does when I talk to my patients. I was talking to an unvaccinated uh, woman earlier this week. Um, and, you know, she was she was not vaccinated and she said she was not interested in getting vaccinated until she heard about this new this new licensed vaccine called Comirnaty. And she's very excited to get Comirnaty as soon as that is available. <laughs> so I think once we have the ability for people to get spike vax, I was talking to one of the nurses today and asked, you know, what what would you choose? The the Comirnaty or the spike vax? I choose uh, spike. So. I choose spike Lee. <laughs> okay. So I think this stuff matters, actually. People seem to care. Um, and the other thing, right, I mean, I, I was not going to include, I, how can you not talk about boosters? That's all anyone wants to talk about. Um, so what, what about the, the data from Israel, the boosters? So this is my plug for Shane Crotty. I, I listened to the Shane Crotty episode. Um, Shane, Shane Crotty is actually one of the people that I reach out to when I've got an immunology question. Um, he, he's brilliant. Um, he, he's, a, he's actually an individual that WHO and a lot of other people turn to when they really want to know what the science shows. And, and if you go to the TWIV episode right before this, um, it's great because everyone's asking him questions. And Shane Crotty is so good. He basically, this is what the science says. You know, he doesn't get ahead of the science. You don't get Shane Crotty's opinion. You get, this is what the science is telling us. So um, if people really want a deep dive, uh, you know, spend that. I think he's on for about the first hour, um, but then stay for the rest of the show. But that that is really great. Um, but what, what created all this fuss? And I'm just going to spend a moment on this. Um, the preprint correlation of SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infections to time from vaccine preliminary study um, was put up as a preprint. Um, now a, a number of statisticians, mathematicians have got a chance to really look at this um, and some of the other data you can bring um, down from the Israeli um, dashboard, so publicly accessible data. Um, and yesterday I got to listen to a really great analysis of this data presented by one of my colleagues, Ephraim Castillo. Uh, he's one of the senior VPs at Optum with whom I work. Um, and he really explained all about how <clears throat> this data was not originally um, correctly analyzed, I explained a bit about Simpson's paradox, where if you don't break it down um, and look at the data correctly, um, it can be concerning. Um, but he went ahead and broke down uh, the, the data by a number of narrower age bands um, and really looked at, okay, if you look at a place like Israel, um, if you look at the, the population, say 90 plus, over 90% are vaccinated. Actually, over 70, if you look at people over the age of 70, really, if you go to people 60 and up, the majority, over 90% are vaccinated, right? These people, you've greatly reduced their risk, but they're still the high risk of ending. And if you go through each, what is the efficacy we're seeing um, for prevention of severe disease? You're seeing in the oldest population an 82-fold reduction in risk in efficacy versus severe disease of over 90%. Um, and you sort of march all the way down. You actually get to the youngest individuals under 30, and you're looking at close to 100% in the 30 to 39, 96.8%. So properly analyzed, I continue to not be concerned by this data. Um, Shane Crotty talked a little bit about, um, you know, are we concerned about infection? 
Um, is there a potential that that's going to be tied in with transmission, potential for long COVID? Um, we'll have to see. But I think this is just when you look at it correctly, there's no reason for panic. Um, the booster study, the booster uh, decisions will be addressed, but you don't need to run out. I get questions every day. Should I run out? Um, if we're going to follow the science, the science is not pushing us. Um, all right. Passive vaccination. I'm almost delighted um, how uh, much my colleagues have taken advantage of the prophylactic indication for monoclonals. Uh, so let me just reinforce this here. Um, so a bit back, um, the Regeneron um, cocktail, Regen Cove, um, was given an expansion of its EUA for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, so the, the US FDA issued an EUA of all these three-letter acronyms, TLAs, um, to permit the emergency use of Regen CoV um, for post-exposure prophylaxis in individuals who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19. Um, and who are these individuals? So one, not fully vaccinated, or they were vaccinated, um, but you have doubts about their ability to mount an adequate immune response. An individual who is on immunosuppressive medications, um, or, or as they say, at high risk of exposure to an individual infected because of occurrence in a, let's say, a nursing home or an institutional setting such as a prison. Um, so I've actually added um, the this as part of my history of present illness. Once I get through with the patient, um, I say, all right, this is great. Now we have a plan for what we're going to do for you, but let's talk about everyone else that you may have exposed who is either exposed and might benefit for prophylaxis or is already infected and might benefit from early treatment. Um, you know, I have to say this has um, really been tremendous in the tri-state area. We are seeing um, a low number of our pro-health and our Optum tri-state folks end up in the hospital because we are doing, I say, a, a tremendous amount of getting these individuals in um, for the monoclonals, keeping them out of the hospital. Um, and a lot of the health systems um, have really helped uh, support access. Uh, you know, tip my hat again um, to, uh, to the Catholic hospitals who really jumped in and helped us with this. All right. Um, I'm going to jump right to the early inflammatory phase, right? Um, so we did have an update, um, an update from the American Society of Hematology Living Guidelines on the use of anticoagulation for thromboprophylaxis in patients with COVID-19. Um, and this was an update on the use um, of anticoagulation in critically ill patients. Um, full disclosure, I'm one of the authors on this. Um, but this was a recommendation um, regarding uh, patients in the hospital who are requiring, requiring critical care. Um, so these are either patients in the ICU, but it's not geographic. So it's patients who require um, that level of support, um, really in favor of prophylactic intensity anticoagulation here. Um, so this is that issue that a patient in the ICU though at increased risk of clotting from COVID-19, and we know that COVID-19 patients have an increased risk, um, we felt reviewing the available literature that the, the risk of bleeding and associated mortality um, was in favor of prophylactic intensity in that setting. Um, so what what's sort of the standard right here? A patient ends up in the hospital, right? They're usually there because they're hypoxic. Their Rubair oxygen level is below 94%. Um, somehow they've either not been vaccinated or they've missed the monoclonals or that small percent of people that progress. Um, we The standard is to start anticoagulation. Here's a little more guidance on dosing. Um, the remdesivir, the dexamethasone, um, but what if they progress, right? We've talked about patients that are requiring more oxygen support. Um, we've talked about tocilizumab in the past. Um, but what if there's a shortage of tocilizumab as we're seeing um, in many parts of the country? Are there other options? Well, um, there is another option that is in the guidelines, but let's talk about a publication in The Lancet that just came out. This was in The Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Efficacy and safety of baricitinib for the treatment of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. This is the COVE barrier study. Um, this was a randomized double blind parallel group placebo controlled phase three trial. Um, so this is, as I like to say, the much awaited results of the COVE barrier study. Um, so as 
you know, really in the title. This was a phase three double blind randomized placebo controlled trial. Participants were enrolled from 101 centers across 12 countries in Asia, Europe, North America, South America. Hospitalized adults with COVID-19 received standard of care, um, were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either receive once daily, um, baricitinib, four milligrams, or matched placebo for up to 14 days. Um, the standard of care included um, corticosteroids, such as dexamethasone, antivirals, remdesivir. Um, they reported the 28-day all-cause mortality was 8% for the 62 folks in the baricitinib and 13% for the 100 in the placebo group, reporting a 38.2% relative reduction in mortality. Um, they're saying one additional death was prevented per 20 treated, so a 20 number needed to treat to prevent one death. Um, the 60-day all-cause mortality was 10% for baricitinib, 15% for placebo. Um, the frequencies of serious adverse events were similar between the two groups. So what, what is this drug, Dr. Griffin? Um, bar <laughs> uh, baricitinib is a Janus kinase inhibitor. Um, it interferes with the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. Um, and the thought is this is actually reducing um, cytokine, particularly IL-6 production. Um, so thus the idea we were, we were concerned, right, using tocilizumab and IL-6 receptor blocker without steroids because the IL-6 levels would shoot up. Here, you're using this agent that actually reduces IL-6 production. Um, so in some other studies, if you're unable to use steroids, um, this is still something that um, you could potentially use. And actually, I'll say this is something that the IDSA has in their um, recommendations, where they're saying among hospitalized patients who are progressing, elevated inflammatory markers. Um, this is something you can consider and also something you can consider in a patient for whom um, steroids cannot be given for whatever reason. Long COVID. Um, and and I, I think it's become really clear, but I'm going to add this to my list of uh, pithy quotations. COVID is not just a two-week viral illness for many people. I mean, you know, early on, we had a lot of people saying, you know, with COVID, you either live or you die, you know, and this perception that it was two weeks. But um, in the MMWR, uh, the article, Long-Term Symptoms Among Adults Tested for SARS-CoV-2, United States, January 2020 to April 2021. This is hot off the press today. Um, as we're recording. Um, and in this report, the authors administered a nationwide internet survey um, to 698 U.S. adults aged greater than or equal to 18 years of age with a positive SARS-CoV-2 test. Um, and they compared them to 2,437 with a negative test, 2,750 that had never been tested. Um, and they reported for those with a positive test, 65.9% had symptoms persisting for greater than four weeks. Um, now, the usual suspects, uh, fatigue, change in smell or taste, shortness of breath, cough, headache. Um, but I'll say the same challenges that we talked about previously in the adolescent study. There's a lot of background. Now we're seeing this above background, um, but a lot of challenges um, in sorting that out. But I will say this is another point in the line, um, you know, that long COVID is a real thing. And it, it significant percent of people are not just better after two weeks. Um, now, there was also a preprint um, posted, severe COVID-19 is associated with sustained biochemical disturbances and prolonged symptomatology, a retrospective retrospective single center cohort study. Um, this is a paper that's up as a preprint, but it's submitted to the Journal of Clinical Medicine. So it'll go through peer review. Um, I'm one of the authors, right? So it's not talk a couple of my publications this time um, or preprint um, postings. Um, and this really describes a cohort of 168 patients with severe COVID-19 previously hospitalized and describes um, how in this cohort um, they have sustained biochemical disturbances, elevated ferritin, D-dimer, elevated neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, so it's nice to start having some objective data. Um, there's been a lot of ideas about what drives long COVID. Um, 
discussion about viral persistence, continue antigenic stimuli. Um, there's always been a lot of thought that this is something with the immune system. Um, so it, it's just nice to have some objective, maybe some breadcrumbs here to start to understand and hopefully be able to help these individuals. Um, what about low and middle income countries and COVID? No one is safe until everyone is safe. I've been having this discussion quite a bit that it is, it is, it is the right thing to do. It is the selfish thing to do to immunize the world. Um, where are all these variants coming from that's keeping everyone awake at night? Um, and we heard from the White House COVID advisor, Jeffrey Zients, that the U.S. plans to invest $3 billion in the vaccine supply chain as it continues to work to position itself as a leading supplier of vaccines for the world. Um, I heard um, some interesting musings by Anthony Fauci about maybe using the PEPFAR network to help with vaccines. Um, but then we just heard that COVAX, a global program to distribute COVID-19 vaccines, cut its 2021 forecast for available doses by one quarter. Um, and there was a what I thought was an interesting, disturbing um, New York Times article by Benjamin Mueller and Daniel E. Slotnick. Um, let me quote, um, in its latest projection, the global immunization program knows, known as COVAX said that it expected to have a total of only, I'm throwing in only, 1.4 billion doses available by the end of 2021. Um, in June, the program had said that it expected to have access to 1.9 billion doses this year. Um, experts have said 11 billion doses are needed to slow the spread of the virus. Um, so just, just to give people perspective, as of now, less than half of a percent of all the doses have been administered in low income countries. Um, so this is not great. Um, so, and maybe with that, I will just go into a reminder. Um, during the months of August, September, and October, um, please go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, go to donate. Um, we are gonna continue to support Floating Doctors, um, who is a, they're, they're a group down in Panama. And as we discussed uh, last week, they're gonna be working with the ministry. They're gonna be getting vaccines out there. Um, really help us uh, because COVID, Co the COVID pandemic is a global pandemic. Um, and if we don't treat it as such, um, we're all at risk. Time for some email questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. John writes, I'm 71. Due to colon cancer, I've lost my spleen, pancreas, half of one lung, and a couple of feet of colon. My health is not great, but my diabetes and blood pressure are well controlled. I received my second dose of Moderna vaccine in February. Is there a test that I can request that will show the condition of my immune system? As of now, I don't feel at all convinced that the vaccine has or will work for me as well as intended. A third dose is available or soon will be. I will get one if only for additional protection against infection. And yes, I do understand the difference between infection and disease. I really don't want the infection. I'm fairly certain that the disease would knock me off my perch. I would really appreciate any information on available tests that would help me to understand my position. Okay. Um, so it, good, good. And I, I appreciate that you added the sophistication at the end because I think that sophistication is required. Um, we do not have any great tests for telling how well does the vaccine um, work against preventing disease, right? Ending up in the hospital, um, death. Uh, there is, I'll say, some information uh, supporting the idea that there's a certain correlate between antibody levels and infection. Um, but I, I'm going to say that sort of with uh, trepidation. Um, you know, the, this is growing. We're learning about this. Um, you know, I'm going to leave it sort of there. We, we, are, we do not have that test, I think, that you want. You want to go ahead and have a test and have that security. There's certain ideas that certain levels of antibodies above a certain threshold um, might be associated with a lower risk of infection. Um, what am I going to advise you to do? So, you know, you would probably be an individual, as you describe, who would qualify for that third shot. Um, we do not know exactly what that results in, right? We're still waiting for the science as far as efficacy, because you don't want to know what happens to my antibodies? You want to know what happens to my risk of infection, what happens to my risk of disease. Um, the second thing, you want to continue to um, 
act cautiously. You do not want to have a run in um, until we have antivirals, until we have some other things that are that um, we can offer. And I mean effective antivirals, not remdesivir, hopefully a product by Merck or Pfizer that comes out in the next couple months. So continue to wear masks, continue to make um, smart decisions. Um, hopefully individuals like you will have more to offer. Debbie writes, I'm an internist who has been educating the physicians in our medium-sized primary care practice since the beginning of the pandemic. As I look to the future of this virus becoming endemic, I'm trying to think how to frame this and what measures to follow. It occurs to me that hospital strain, and that's not strain of virus, by the way, that's strain on the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> is one of the most important things to follow. In my home state of Texas, our non-medical governor has decided 15% of beds being occupied by COVID patients was a measure of distress. I can follow this number on the Johns Hopkins website for my state. Locally, it's harder to follow. It seems that hospital strain numbers are not universally agreed upon and also seem to change. Hospitals are used to growing capacity during surges and emergencies. Is there any agreed upon and standardized measure of hospital strain? And if so, any reliable website for looking at it? I'm also following the percent positive rate only as an indication of adequacy of testing and then looking at cases per 100,000 per seven days on the CDC website or globalepidemics.org. Additionally, home testing or very easily accessible testing is going to have to be a much bigger part of the solution moving forward. $20 for two tests is too expensive. Here in Texas, it's hard to find home tests. Scheduled tests are two days out and turnaround times are increasing. Okay, so a lot, lot in that email. Um, so, talking first about hospital um, occupancy and how that correlates with um, with how much a hospital can handle. Um, so that those that's really the number. What is the um, what is the percent of beds? What's the hospital um, capacity? Um, what's the percent of filled beds? The other is actually looking at ICU. Um, you know, what percent of the beds? And in New York, they actually have good. Um, sites that you can go to keep track of that. So that, that's one of the things, because remember, it's not just about COVID. You know, you, you break your leg, you're in a car accident, you need chemotherapy. Um, you know, there's, there's a myriad of other reasons why people end up going to, to hospital. Um, and so if those beds are all full of COVID, that's, that's a problem that does strain the system. Um, yeah, there is a certain ability to deal with increased capacity surges. We see this a lot of times with influenza respiratory um, season. So that's that's helpful. Um, testing, yes. Um, that I think as you went through that was a very sophisticated analysis. You know, if you're if you're in the UK, right, you go to a website and next thing you know, you've got free testing. Um, here in the US, ten, eleven dollars per test. That does not encourage people to get tested. Um, if anything, it's penny wise, pound foolish. It is incredibly expensive when someone ends up in the hospital with COVID and um, it is a lot cheaper to prevent that. So, Jamie writes, I am a primary care clinician, a family nurse practitioner of 19 years with a doctorate in translational research. Two clinical questions. One, we're in California and have vaccine mandates for our public employee sectors. I had my first patient asking for a medical excuse from the mandate, which as of now can be religious or medical. This 30-something patient is currently undergoing infertility treatments and wants to wait until after she is either pregnant or gives birth to get the vaccine. Ask me to put in writing that there are no risks to pregnancy or fertility treatments, which of course I cannot do. I discussed with her the risks of COVID while being pregnant and asked her to talk to her reproductive health provider and come back in two weeks prior to the mandate's effective date so we can make a determination while I do more research. I wanted to talk to our fellow clinicians and have an office-wide approach knowing that the only real CI to vaccination is allergy to vaccine ingredients. This person is in a forward-facing public law enforcement position. What would be your guidance for this case, as well as to guide policy protocols, knowing there's always some flexibility for clinicians when we issue protocols here? Yeah, so um, th this is a great question, right? Because this has been coming up and um, and the patients are angry, right? Um, and the way our healthcare system works, like, well, I'm going to find a doctor who, or a clinician, a provider, basically someone who's going to sign this. Um, and 
as this emailer, as you write in, um, there really are um, only these two exceptions. Either you have an anaphylactic um, issue, anaphylactic reaction to this vaccine, you have had an anaphylactic reaction to that first dose you got, or you have an anaphylactic issue with one of the components. Well, you're going to have to, you know, look at the mRNA. That's going to be the PEG 2000. Um, look at J and J. You'll have to see if there's an issue there. Um, but in general, there are very few individuals, even individuals that have had other allergic issues. Um, most of them can successfully be vaccinated. Um, what you're being asked is really the wrong question. You know, guaranteeing this person, you know, a long, healthy life and successful infertility treatments. Um, none of us can do that. Uh, the vaccines are not without risks. Um, you know, this is like them asking for some sort of uh, guarantee that that seatbelt will not cause sternal bruising if they get into an accident. Um, now, I think what this person is requesting of you is, is not reasonable. So what we've tried to do um, as organizations is just put in writing, these are the exceptions. And there was a recent call um, for Northwell. It was an email that went out by um, David Battinelli, a really superior clinician and uh, leader. And he basically said to all the Northwell physicians, these are the exceptions. If you're giving exceptions, if you're making up reasons for medical exceptions, that's not okay. Um, and that really sounds what this person is saying. They're saying, please give me a medical exception while I go through these fertility treatments. That is not in the list of exceptions. All right. Question number two, more personal uh, on, on July 4th, my 45-year-old otherwise healthy husband developed chest pain, brought him to the ER. He had elevated D-dimer, uh, multiple RPE on CTA, nodule in the thyroid currently being worked up. He had received the J&J vaccine 10 weeks prior to this incident and had been feeling fatigued, reported to VAERS, and they followed up right away, but we don't know and may never know if this was a causative factor. So the question is, should he opt for one of the mRNA injections instead of another J&J? &J? You know, so sort of hearing this story, it's um, it's hard for me to know if there's any connection. It does, it does not sound in any way compelling for there to be a connection here. Um, but, you know, you sort of this is this is that gray of medicine where we always work, where, you know, there's no reason not to use an mRNA vaccine in the future. Um, and I think that's a reasonable choice. But there's nothing you're telling me here that that connects the dots for me for me and makes me worry that this is J and J related. All right. One more from Lynn. Just listen to an Andy Slavitt podcast with Johns Hopkins epidemiologist Jennifer Nuzo. Very worthwhile discussion of post-vaccination infection. Note that I don't use the word breakthrough. <laughs> there was some discussion as well about boosters, and my impression was that global vaccine equity plays too small a role in the booster decision, but that's not where my two questions for you lie. After the interview was over, Slavitt opined on several COVID-related matters. He did a good job explaining waning, neutralizing antibodies and memory T cells responding to viral attack. He then went on to say that the memory B cell and T cell response is slower to appear, and that could lead to symptoms and disease before full immune response kicks in. His argument for boosters is that those antibodies that appear directly after a boost will afford more protection against symptoms and disease. If you're dead set against symptoms, then a booster is your thing. Is this correct? To his credit, Slavid gives a very well-articulated discussion on the pros and cons, politically and medically, of boosters. He feels that boosters, the immunocompromised, vulnerable, elderly, and healthcare workers in the U.S. is fair. Boosting everyone else before the rest of the world has vaccine access is not. All right, let's do that one first. Okay, so first I'm going to say um, Jennifer Nuzzo, she's, she's fantastic, right? Um, and, and everything Jennifer says, um, I remember, I actually listened to that podcast um, and uh, everything Jennifer says, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of thumbs up. She really gives um, an ex expert scientific um, basis to what she has to say. Now, I love Andy. Andy actually is an old Optum executive, right? So he did a great job uh, helping with the vaccine rollout. Uh, but I worry about Andy is he's very articulate. He's very charismatic. Um, he's very persuasive. He's not a doctor. Um, and so I often feel like he oversteps. Right. So, you know, it's it's actually interesting if you go back and listen to sort of his older podcasts and watch as it evolves. Um, yeah. So I, I actually listen to his podcast. He does a great job. But everything Andy says, take it with a grain of salt. Um, he's a great 
logistics guy. He's the guy you call if you want help, maybe using PEPFAR to get those vaccines out there. Um, but if you want good science, if you want good medical advice, um, listen to his guests. <laughs> so, I would say if you have can only listen to one podcast, listen to TWIV, not Slavit. <laughs> yes. All right, second question. Slavit said that smarter people than he are pushing for the J&J &J vaccinated to get an mRNA vaccine. Where is the data that supports this? And would it be one <laughs> dose or two? Yeah, I remember when he made that comment and, you know, sort of say he talked to a whole bunch of really smart people. And uh, yeah, you know, again, Andy Slavitt, he's charismatic. He's a great public speaker. Um, but yeah, take it with a grain of salt. There's no science that supports that recommendation. I don't know who these smart people are. Uh, by the way, Lynn uh, off has written into TWIV. She is the retired molecular biologist from Western Massachusetts and grandmother to the epitope obsessed grandson. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love that. That's Isn't fantastic. that great? That's COVID-19 clinical update number 79 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, including you, Vincent, be safe. <laughs>